Welcome into another edition of the Original Gangsters podcast. This is another uh, solo quick hitter. I'm Scott Bernstein, your host. Jimmy Bucciolato will be back for the full-length episode uh, later this week. But right now, I want to do a a breakdown of some headline-grabbing news out of New York City uh, this past week and then tie it into uh, the evergreen mob subject of John Gotti and the Campino crime family. But uh, let's start with uh, the story of the Salinardi um, bloodline in the New York Mafia. So this past week, uh, 31-year-old Vincent Salinardi Jr., a.k.a. Vinny Mercedes, was indicted by the feds um, along with three co-conspirators. They were charged, uh, I believe, under the Hobbs Act, uh, connected to a November 2000 and 21 armed robbery of a pretty prominent restaurant owner, a um, uh, place called Bocce, uh, I believe. Uh, and uh, there's original ones in Bay Ridge. And uh, the one that this assault and robbery took place at is in Staten Island, uh, Dongan Hills. Uh, Dongan Hills. Um, and Vinny Mercedes, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He's got a father and a grandfather that come from the life um, that have a mob pedigree, or he has a mob pedigree that goes back to his his uh, father, who was a Lucchese, who turned government informant in the 2000s. And then um, his grandfather is an interesting uh, figure also that dates all the way back to the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Peter Salinardi, who they called Sonny Boy. And both Sonny Boy and... Vinny Baldi have kind of tangential ties into the John Gotti regime and people that were linked to him. Uh, and I'm going to kind of color up that story after I, I talk about Vinny Mercedes, um, who's allegedly an associate of the Colombo crime family and is in Rikers Island right now serving uh, a 10 month sentence for a domestic, a domestic abuse or domestic assault. And he was just jammed up in this Fed case that goes to this uh, goes back almost two years to this armed robbery. And Vinny Mercedes, you know, cased the joint, knew the guy. Uh, this this Italian restaurant owner uh, carried about ten thousand dollars in cash with him uh, out of the restaurant to his car and then uh, to his house uh, most nights and. They planned to get him when he was coming uh, to his car in the parking lot with with a leather bag uh, with with 10K in it. And Vinny Mercedes recruited some people, a guy he met, I think, at his gym, who then recruited some other people. These guys were, or at least two of them, including Vinny Mercedes, was uh, or is alleged uh, to be possibly involved in narcotics trafficking. Um, That's hasn't been proven, but alleged. And uh, Vinny Mercedes, you know, sets it up, plans it out, but lets these three other people actually do the attack. And the restaurant owner was caring. And uh, the the mob thugs got away with the 10,000 in the leather bag, but the restaurant owner got off a shot uh, you know, with his uh, with his weapon and shot one of the uh, assailants who ended up crashing his car and having to go to the hospital, which kind of blew this whole thing open. Uh, but according to the indictment, Vinny Mercedes uh, ended up with the 10K. He had got passed off to him by the guy that got shot at the Staten Island Mall. And then they went their separate ways. And, and the guy that got shot ended up passing out while he was driving. And um so not only does he have this armed robbery federal case um, a couple days after that indictment dropped, the feds filed a obstruction or made allegations of an obstruction of justice charge when it came out that Vinny Mercedes, after he was visited by the FBI back last month in Rikers Island, before the case came down, 
he uh, jumped on the phone right after these these two feds left the facility and in code was talking to another Columbia Colombo associate uh, telling him to get word to uh, his superiors of what had happened. We don't know who those superiors are, um, but that's kind of where we stand with Vinny Mercedes right now. Again, he's a young guy. He's got a history of domestic uh, disturbances. There was something back when he was 19, 20. Um, and then there's just a more recent thing in the past year to year to 18 months. Uh, but again, he, he has a, quite the, the lineage. So uh, his dad was Vincent Salinardi Sr., who uh, went by the nickname Vinnie Baldi. I'm told that Vinnie Mercedes sometimes goes by uh, Little Vinnie Baldi or even Vinnie Baldi or Little Baldi, Junior Baldi, and that the Mercedes uh, nickname might be a little bit, you know, media uh, created or um, police created. But uh, I'm going to start with the story of, of his grandfather, and then I'm going to tell you the story of his father, and then uh, we'll you know we'll see what happens from there. But his grandpa was a uh, Peter. Sonny Boy Salinardi, who was kind of like a hired gun, worked for multiple families, Lucchese's, Gambino's, Bonanno's. Um, I think he was officially on record with Bonanno's. And in 1972, the Gambino crime family, John Gotti's mentor, Neil De La Croche, uh, who is you know, one of the most venerable, powerful, beloved, respected, you know, mafia figures in, in American history in the last three quarters of a century. And uh, he, he ran his operations out of the Ravenite Social Club on Mulberry Street in Little Italy for 40 years uh, until he died. And then it was taken over by his protege, John Gotti. And in 1972, in the summer of 1972, August, the first week of August, 1972, uh, a Lucchese drug lieutenant named Carlo Lombardi, who was linked pretty heavily into the French Connection, a heroin um, empire, uh, had a beef with these two brothers, the Consalvo brothers, Frank and, and Carmine Consalvo, who were close to Mr. Neal. And uh, I believe Frank Consalvo was De La Croce's driver. And Lombardi had this I think it was a, a beef over a, a, a drug ripoff. And uh, August 1st, 1972, Lombardi comes blasting into the Ravenite and gets off four or five shots with a pistol. Um, the guy you know, doesn't hit his targets, but he's aiming at the Consolvos and aiming at Neil De La Croce, who's like, again, it's like shooting at God. Um, the guys in the club jump him. They're beating him severely. It looks like uh, they might have beat him to death before uh, just a beat cop uh, interrupts the altercation and gets him to a hospital where he's stitched up and then checks himself out of the hospital. Seven days later, Carlo Lombardi gets a machine gun and goes back into the Ravenite and starts popping off more shots, aiming again at Mr. Neal. And the Consolvos, his gun jams, somehow he flees before, before he's uh, apprehended. And at that point, you know, it's like if, if you live another week, you're the luckiest man in the world. And he lived about 24 hours. Uh, and that's where Sonny Boy Salinardi comes in. So the uh, Gambinos give the contract to the Lucchese's and the Bonanos. And Sonny Boy Salinardi and his one of his running buddies, uh, a guy by the uh, name uh, Nicky Mussolino, who went by Nicky the Nut. Uh, Salinardi knows Carlo Lombardi and kind of rocks him to sleep, pretends like he's going to help him and take him to a safe house up in the Catskills. This is less than 24 hours after the second attack. And so Sonny Boy and uh, Nicky the Nut come and pick up Lombardi and Lombardi's girlfriend, a woman named Elizabeth Bryce's, I believe, uh, at a hotel in Secaucus, New Jersey. 
and they promise they're going to drive him up to a safe house in uh, around Monticello. And when they get up near Monticello, Nikki the Nut is at, you know, in the driver's seat in Sonny Boy Salinardi. He's in the passenger seat up front. And he turns around and uh, unloads his, his pistol into uh, both Carlo Lombardi and Carlo Lombardi's girlfriend. They dump the bodies in a ditch in Sullivan County and take off. Unfortunately for them, but fortunately for Miss Bryce's, she survives the attack and ends up testifying against Mussolino in court. He gets 30 years, um, but it's a, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't come guns blazing into uh, a, a, a hornet's nest like that, uh, you know, a mob hotbed of all mob hotbeds uh, and do it twice and think that you're going to uh, walk away with your life. And uh, Carl Lombardi, you know, paid the ultimate price. Sonny Boy Salinardi's son, uh, Vinnie Baldi, Salinardi Sr., ends up with the Lucchese's, uh, gets inducted according to court records in uh, 1998, is placed with uh, Johnny Sideburns, uh, who is Johnny Sorella, longtime Lucchese veteran, mafia figure in that family. Uh, it's been a skipper for decades. And uh, Salinardi Sr., Vinnie Baldi, makes you know a pretty good reputation for himself as a, as a collector, thief, extortionist, drug trafficker. And what ends up being his downfall is another tie to the to the Gotti regime. So uh, at the end of you know Gotti's it, the reign is over with, he's in prison, locked up, dying of cancer. Uh, convicted on, on multiple murder counts. He had a kind of an, a, a, a quasi surrogate son, a Jewish guy named Louis Kassman, who was the unofficial kind of financial counselor for, for Gotti uh, at, at the, at the apex of his uh, mob tenure at the top of the Gambino crime family, spent a lot of time with the Gotti family leverage the name and, and the currency of being associated and in, and in, in, in such close proximity to Gotti all around you know all around New York all around the country and uh in in 2000 Cassman partners with uh the sons of a of a Lucchese associate named Philly Basile who was connected into that Goodfellas crew the movie that you you know the, the crew you saw in the movie Henry Hill Jimmy the Gent Two Gun Tommy that was Philly Basile's crew. Philly Basile had two sons, Roger and Frank Basile, and they partnered with Louis Kassman in a uh, a high end surf and turf restaurant, a seafood restaurant called uh, Hudson and McCoy Fish House um, in uh, Long Island in Freeport, right off right right off the water, and it's immediately very successful, very popular. But within a year, they're bleeding money because Cassman is is stealing, uh, skimming uh, from the till, and the Basiles go run to their father's um, associates. Their their dad had passed away in 1996, but uh, they reach out to a, a former acting boss in the Lucchese's, Joe Defiti, little Joe, um, and and Defiti sends. Johnny Cyburns and Vinnie Baldi to troubleshoot the situation. They troubleshoot it by muscling Cassman out of the business. Cassman doesn't have Gotti to run to anymore, isn't protected by him. Cassman ends up flipping eventually uh, himself. But uh, they didn't really alleviate the extortion problem for the Basile brothers. They just exchanged one extortionist for another. And Vinnie Baldi and Johnny Cyburns uh, start bleeding the bleeding the place dry themselves. Uh, starting in the summer of 2001, they're taking about ten thousand dollars a night. Uh, they're pocketing it, and little do they know. In early 2002, little Joe Defeaty comes out of prison, and he knows that he is in the doghouse with Lucchese bosses, suspected of skimming himself in other rackets before he'd gone to jail when he was the acting boss and not 
properly filtering the, the cash uh, to other other higher ups in the family. And unprompted, he goes, runs to the FBI and uh, helps them make a case. Cases against Vinnie Baldi and, and Johnny Cyburns and about uh, another close to two dozen Lucchese's uh, case drops in December of 2002. A couple years into the case, Vinnie Baldi flips, enters witness protection, but is kicked out of witness protection like two years later because he has his girlfriend on the outside collecting debts for him. Uh, has to do another six years. Uh, came out about a decade ago and not really sure where Vinny Baldi is, but we definitely know where his son is. His son's in Rikers Island right now, finishing up a domestic uh, abuse case, but is about to be fighting or is fighting uh, a federal um, Hobbs Act armed robbery case. So with the Columbos. Uh, so we'll keep you updated here at the OG for Benny behind the glass and for Jimmy, who will be back in the full length episode. Um, OG pod, we're out. <laughs>